You guys want to see an Emmy? Do you? Me too. <laughs> You're cheating on me. Whoa! That's kind of like... Well, why didn't you tell me? This is very cool. This is great. I was tripping balls. <laughs> Hope you guys liked it. <laughs> New phone, who did? Holy moly. And I'm like, whoa. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm shocked too, guys. <laughs> So let's welcome up Sarah Polly, Ryan Johnson, and Joe Robert Cole. Yeah. It's so intimidating moderating, you guys, especially for three movies that are exactly the same as each other. Um, I. I loved all three of these movies. I told you guys that outside. Um, I think this is an amazing year in both categories for film and especially for writers. So I'm gonna ask you the deeply annoying question that Franklin Leonard asked me last year on this panel right away and it was a quick fire answer and don't think too much about it. Just finish the sentence. Um, we'll start with you. I write movies about. Human beings. Benoit Blanc, and that is <laughs> nice, I guess. <laughs> Funny ladies. <laughs> um, maybe now that's out of the way. <laughs> um, I'm I'm interested. I'm always interested where people start out in their careers as writers. Um, for me, there was a big gap between when I started writing and when I felt like a writer or called myself a writer. Um, so I'm interested how you guys started out, how you, maybe what was the first screenplay you ever wrote? Oh, I, I go first every time. You pick I'm the right. pole position. You don't have to, yeah, you don't have to. just because you're sitting next to me doesn't no, mean you no, have to go fine. first. Um, Sarah I, went right for the end. She's a pro. She yeah, right there, but yeah, I'm learning. Um, so halfway through my freshman year of college, I decided I wanted to tell stories, and I, I went to uh, a bookstore, and I got Sid Field's screenplay, and I just started writing, and, and I wrote my first script then, and I'm afraid to look at it, because I can only imagine <laughs> how it's probably unreadable, but I just kept writing after that, so that was my first script. And were you kind of self-taught? Were you, were you, what were you using to become better as a writer? Um, well, it's interesting. I I grew up making up stories. I'm an only child, and so I just played make believe a lot, and um, and I like watching people, and so a lot of it is just kind of um, feeling what's happening and and wanting to, to say a certain thing and, and just trusting. I, I have no idea. I mean, that's not a very good answer. <laughs> it is a good answer, I uh, like it. Yeah, so I, it was helpful for me for structure, but in telling a story, it's like, oh, what do I, what do I wanna tell? What do I wanna say? How, does this, how do I wanna feel? How do I want someone who reads this to feel? So. Ryan, how did you start? What was the first thing you ever wrote? Oof. Yeah, in college I wrote a script called Ichthyology the Movie. It was terrible, terrible. It must never, <laughs> it must never see the light of day. It was really, really bad. But, um, uh, but yeah, and then I, um, I wrote, I wrote my first film, Brick, right when I was kind of right out of 
right out of college. So, um, and uh, uh, yeah, have have kind of tried to <laughs> tried to earn the name, the the moniker writer ever since. I guess, yeah. Um, the first thing I ever wrote was a screenplay called Itchy, and it was about a child actor. And um, it was turned down over the course of four years by various film funding agencies in Canada, each time in a more humiliating way than the last. <laughs> I think it was a real blessing that it didn't get made, actually. But um, yeah, it was. And then I think that I decided I wasn't going to go through that process again. And I adapted something and I sort of gave myself a deadline and said, if it's not done by this date, I'm never trying again. Like, I'm happy to just act, I'm not gonna do this anymore. And then I think it was actually that obsession and that drive and that's that sense of this must get done or else that actually propelled it to, to get made. That's interesting and this will follow up that question. So I, I really think like films that we make are a marker of where we're at in our lives when we make them. Um, I read an interview or heard an interview with you, Sarah, where you talked about like if I could go back and recut my first movie, I would cut 10 minutes. And I feel like that. I'm like, I wish I could go back and recut my first feature. So reflecting on that, those these first three terrible screenplays that you guys wrote, um, maybe not so terrible, I doubt it. Terrible. But, Awful. But I'm wondering like what what do you know now as a writer? Or what 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 have you learned in your process that you feel like you implement now that you didn't? No, then. Sarah, you want to take one? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I think ruthlessness. I think that rigor to lose things that are very dear to me. I think that I'm just far less pained by that now. And it still hurts, but I think that idea of making the whole work um, is something I've really developed over time in that sense of wanting to be wanting to be more efficient because I, I did take 10 years off and I can look back now with the distance of time and see that those 10 minutes could have come out of everything I've made. And in, in one or at least two cases, there have been editors who have suggested that, that I've you know rejected that suggestion, but now it would be very easy for me to go cut that. So the idea of wanting to just compress that thinking process so it takes less than 10 years to figure out where you could take the 10 minutes out. Do you guys have something you feel like you've learned? I mean, that's a fantastic answer. That's it. Yeah, then, and that speaks really true. It's also, I feel like having made a couple of things, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a stand-up comic who goes up on stage and bombs a couple of times. That's going to be like, the, hard, the that's the way you learn actual lessons is by doing stuff and it doesn't work and then having to, you know, figure out a way to fix it in the edit and realizing, and, and that lends to a certain amount of, um, uh, of ruthlessness when you're when you're doing it. I also I, I do also think the more the more you write, there is an element of it where it is a, a bit just like working out a muscle. I think I think there is an undefinable element of the more you do it, um, the it, it 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 just is a thing where you 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 find yourself kind of feeling the contours of it and being able to tap into kind of how you approach it in a way that's actually useful. I guess. Yeah. I I I don't know. What I would add, um, other than I, you just, in a way, you 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 realize you don't know as much as you know, and and that as a, a storyteller is is great because the the characters and the craft kind of helps you along if you trust that you don't have all the answers, um, and I think that works whether it's writing or whether you're directing or when you're in the edit, all of the things I think that they spoke about. Um, I love that ruthlessness because I feel like I, that is it. You just slash your babies early on so you don't have to shoot them. <laughs> and yet you always still think you're down to the bone and then you get in the edit and you're like, oh shit, we're still 10 minutes too long. How did this happen? So it's still, I don't know, it feels like, or maybe I just, yeah, just haven't learned. I just no, need, I mean, need more pain in my life so that I learn yes. more how to cut easier. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to ask you guys about the spark for these films. And I'll start with Sarah um, and just, you know, talk to me about reading the book and, and what was it about the book that made you feel like, oh, shit, this has to be a movie? I mean, I'm not even sure I could have consciously articulated at the time. I just wanted to live inside that conversation forever. I never wanted it to end 
it felt transformative to me that this group of women had gathered in this act of radical democracy to imagine a way forward so that it wasn't just about identifying harms, which I think we were in the process of doing so much of, which was important work, but the idea of moving that conversation forward to how do we work together now, even if we don't agree on some fundamental issues, how do we sit in a room, come to consensus, and imagine something better, and what would that look like? And I think it gave me a sense of forward motion and propulsion that I think I had so desperately needed um, in the middle of this conversation we'd been having about inequity and gender-based violence. And um, so I think I was just so excited about the optimism in this and the, the possibility. And you read the book and you reached out uh, to the author. Um, and then can you just quickly talk about how that, that evolution happened of making it into a film? Sure, so I, I found out shortly after reading the book that Frances McDormand and Dee Dee Gardner had optioned it. So I actually reached out to them, um, and the same day they reached out to me. So our emails crossed, and so that felt very, you know, one of those coincidences that you read meaning into because it's more fun to live life that way. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, it just felt immediately like we had this really vibrant dynamic and conversations, and we're challenging each other, the three of us, and, and those conversations just kind of kept happening in these concentric circles throughout the process. Cool, and Ryan and Joe, I mean, you both made films that are sequels to very successful films, um, but you don't go into making a movie because you're trying to please the studio and give them another success. You go in because you think the story, there's more story to tell or there's another story to tell. Um, what was the spark for you when you really saw it and thought, oh, I can see, I can see another, a film here. Well, for the iteration of the script that we have, our, you know, honestly, the spark was um, having the discussions where we decided we weren't going to recast Chad and kind of talking about how we were feeling. And, you know, one of the, the great things about the first film and that, that we also were you know, approach this, this film with was to be personal. And uh, I think the spark was realizing what we were going through, the grief we were going through, and that that could be translated into uh, the story and into the characters. And it, uh, and it was intrinsic to how we were gonna approach the story. And so once we got there, it was like, okay, we know what we're gonna do. We, we know the story we're gonna tell now. And did you have sort of this image of your villain? Was that part of your, because I thought that was such an interesting part of the movie. Was that something that had, was there right from the start? Yeah, um, our, you know, we, we knew, uh, Namor existed in, the, in our first draft. You know, we, we wrote a, we were in the second draft of the movie when Chad passed, so we had written the movie and we were moving forward. So the, the movie, there is a, second version of it but Namor was always the he was always the villain and um, you know we wanted to broaden out the the kind of uh, the world of Wakanda and explore again uh, another uh, uh, group of people of color and colonialism and just kind of look at those uh, issues within the dynamic of, of a superhero movie again and so um, you know we you know, we had done a bunch of research and had consultants and all this sort of thing. And so we knew he was gonna be there. And, and our approach to, and we don't think of them as villains, we think of them as antagonists and trying to find the uh, place of empathy um, that we can approach those characters with and then that we can, um, hopefully an audience would as well. Um, I, loved, I loved the marriage in both Black Panthers of sort of these big political, like looking at colonialism in a Marvel movie. <laughs> um, and again, this is also addressed to Ryan, like the, the question of the spark of why make this movie? And then I'll also frame it in, you know, you've said, there's a quote you said about this is like a primal scream against the past six years or this, you know, it seemed like you said that it was really smart. I read it somewhere. It was a great <laughs> quote. So I can't awful. even can't even quote it right as I'm <laughs> quoting it back to you. Um, I'm sure I did. But it felt like a takedown of 
you know, a kind of internet culture or like, you know, can you talk about what sparked kind of the, the seed of this film or what you were exploring with it? Yeah, yeah, there were kind of, there were two, uh, there, there was kind of two tracks or sort of the, the genre thing I was excited about, which was um, just going back to kind of Agatha Christie's books and thinking about, um, and that's, I guess, the only reason why I was excited about doing another in the series is the idea that this can be completely different than the first one um, and exactly how different it can be. Um, not just a whole new cast, a whole new story, but a whole new setting, but also a whole new tone, um, very different tone than the first one. And um, I don't know, just the notion of kind of showing that um, this this series and this genre can be used in so many different ways. And Agatha Christie was doing that all the way up until the end of her life. I mean, she never repeated herself. So that was just that challenge was exciting to me. And then, yeah, and then there's the level of, because uh, you always have to so have something that, um, you know, something that you're you're pissed off about, I guess, to, to sit down and start writing. And, and there was plenty of that the past six years. So <laughs> just kind of tried and to get in. this was before like, Elon yeah. Musk started all of his yeah. antics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was there was a whole other other kind of like cloud of, of internet douchebags kind of <laughs> a few years ago. And there will be another cloud two years from now. And the circle will be unbroken. But um, but it was, no, but, but that, that uh, I don't know, like with the, I, th I feel like um, he's, you know, uh, he always takes up a lot of oxygen in any conversation, but the truth is it, it was not actually, when I was writing, it got less and less interesting the more specific I got about kind of just, you know, making jokes about specific people. What was more interesting to me, and this is, it, it makes a lot of sense hearing Joe with the, with the um, antagonists in both of the Black Panther movies, the fact that, um, the notion of with your worst characters always having to kind of point the lens inward and find the thing that um, not just you empathize with, but that you relate to in them. And um, so, uh, so I don't know. With with the character of the billionaire, it was looking inward at myself at that uniquely American thing that I know I have inside me. Maybe also a Canadian. I don't know. But um, then that. Um, of mistaking uh, wealth for competence and how we love to sling shit at these people, but we also kind of secretly hope that they're, they, maybe they'll be Willy Wonka, maybe they'll take us up in the great glass elevator at the end of the day. So kind of turning that back on myself and trying to, um, I don't know, that's, that's the way I think you have to approach any despicable person. Did any of your characters surprise you as you were writing them? Like was anyone, you started out with one idea about them and then through the writing kind of went, oh, you're not what I thought you were at all. Um, I mean, I think maybe, maybe my, I think the, the one that did that the most for me was um, the character that Janelle Monae plays, who is, um, uh, who is, is Andy, and I'm glancing out. I'm, I guess we can talk spoilers. If anyone, anyone cover your ears if you haven't seen Glass Onion yet. As if you haven't seen Glass Onion, there's something wrong with you. No, so. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> but um, that was a real development in terms of figuring out. Um, who she was as Helen, as the sister, and figuring out um, uh, just because that had to, that was kind of what was going to drive the second half of the movie and, um, and make the entire thing tick, this kind of weird fugue structure we tried to do with it. So, so it, was, it was a lot of in the writing process. And it was, I wrote a draft where she was just entirely wrong, and I had to go back and kind of refigure out who she was and get inside her head and figure out what wasn't working about it. And, and reattack it. So that that was a big process. Yeah. The 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 second version of her was wrong. The second version of her was wrong. Yeah, yeah I I'd ran her as much more of kind of. I, it was when I realized, um, and this goes into uh, the structure of it, just because the initial challenge was how do you do the thing where you tell a story, you do a hard reset, you retell the same story from a different perspective, and keep the audience. Engaged because I, I hear that described and my shoulders sag like oh god we gotta sit through all this again. Um, so the notion of it can't just be a different intellectual perspective. The thing that we need is to introduce the character, a character that you actually care about at that midpoint, and that was the key to me is figuring out how to what what would make me care about Helen and what would make me actually invest in her immediately so that when we're off to the races in that second half, I want to see her burn the Mona Lisa at the end of it, you know. 
Um, I love, when, when did the Mona Lisa come? When were you like, I'm going to put the Mona Lisa in this movie? <laughs> It was, and I apologize, I feel like I've been talking for a while. I'll just be quick. The, um, uh, it, the Mona Lisa kind of, once I realized there had to be something incredibly important that he had to burn that was going to serve the function it did in the story, the options narrowed very quickly. Because right. <laughs> it needed to be, and the Mona Lisa was kind of perfect because um, uh, it's so famous that it's famous kind of for being famous. It's an amazing work of art, but that most people's relationship to it, I think, was such that I felt like the audience would give us that and kind of get in on the on the joke and let us <laughs> have our hero destroy <laughs> one of the great artworks of the century, yeah, of mankind. Um, Sarah, uh, it, in the line of talking about protagonists and antagonists, I thought it was interesting that sort of the, there's the antagonists in the film, which are the men, who you largely don't see, but then really looking at this ensemble and um, sort of playing with that idea of shifting allegiances and shifting perspectives and sort of, especially with the Jesse Buckley character, I was drawn to the, you know, she was sort of so antagonistic and then she almost becomes the center of the heart. Um, can you talk about that discovery? Like, was that a discovery for you as you were writing or was it something you were playing with? Yeah, I think it was a discovery as I was writing, and I think I realized there was a moment missing for that character, that in order for her to become really integrated into that community and their project, there had to be a moment where the community was accountable for the damage they had done to her, and that she... Act I'd been reading a lot of um, Harriet Lerner's work on apologies and accountability, and that book, Why Won't You Apologize, which I think is so amazing, and just the transformational power of a good apology, both for the person receiving it and the person giving it. Um, and I just realized that if there was, you know, this moment where people apologized for the complicity um, that they had all had in her abuse, um, there would be a moment where we could really, she could be kind of blasted open, we could kind of understand her, and she could have this quite radical shift in the moment that would allow her to progress and become the person who really leads them forward by the end. Um, so I just, it was sort of missing, I think in the novel it, it works beautifully, but that moment isn't there, it's not necessary in the same way, and this sort of concentrated version of the film, it was really necessary to unpack this person who had been really such an obstacle throughout so much of the film in terms of stopping the forward momentum. Um, I want to talk about research for a minute, because I love research, it really helps me, it feels like it unlocks things for me that are sometimes big and unexpected. Um, can you guys talk about something that you researched? You know, Ryan, were you going down Twitter rabbit holes? Were you were you in researching Mayan culture? Like, what were kind of and was there anything in your research that kind of gave you an aha moment about your script? Uh, we, I mean, we had um, a really wonderful. Um, consultant, um, an expert in the Maya people and uh, Mesoamerica, and um, and I, I think the glyphs were just remarkable. In the film, the, the glyphs are all authentic, and they, they are so, um, it's such a profound language that that's so different than anything um, I had been exposed to, and to have him sit around and explain what, you know, what our glyphs are saying, and and the significance of them within uh, the the ancient Maya uh, uh, people, it was it was fascinating. So. I feel like if, if I can write off all the time, I fuck around on Twitter as research. I'm, I, I'll leave this panel a happy man. Oh, research is the best procrastination technique. You're like, I have to call this person, obviously, right at this moment. Yeah. Well, I went deep then, because, yeah, he's been... <laughs> no, it's just been kind of living in that world and unfortunately absorbing it, yeah. Um, I, I had amazing conversations with people who live in more conservative Mennonite communities and also more sort of urban progressive Mennonites and just learning a lot about that faith was amazing for me because it was really important for me to honor that faith and to get to know those women's faith on their terms, not the terms of someone looking back from a secular perspective. 
And so figuring out how to honor what was really incredible about that specific faith, the sort of collectivity and the selflessness and the lack of individualism and materialism, um, that was amazing research to do because we were telling such a difficult story. So to figure out how do we create a, the kind of guardrails where people will understand what these women are fighting for and that it isn't about abandoning their faith, it's about moving towards it. Um, oh, we're running out of time. I have like 150 questions for you guys. I'm, um, I guess for Joe, I, this movie is seeped in grief, um, you know, and I felt, I felt that grief watching the film. Um, and I'm curious, you mentioned briefly your process of sort of what that was in writing from that place, but, you know, where did it lead you in terms of discoveries in the writing? Yeah, I mean, what we were trying to, what we were trying to explore was how you overcome grief. How do you get past it? How do you make it aspirational? The idea, the, 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 that was what we were scratching at. That was like the, the journey, and it's the journey we tried to take um, Letitia's character on. Was this, you know, you know, the phases, the stages of grief, and and how and, and where you. Uh, where you can end up in a place that's better than perhaps you know where you started, where you ever thought you could be again. Um, and so I think at the very end, the the, the part that you missed at the first time. You I told it. Joe before this, I was like crying so hard at the end of the movie with the the Chadwick like the silent sort of beautiful images of him, and I just like watched the credits and walked away, and I was like, oh, I forgot that Marvel has the whole tag at the end. I literally missed the end of the movie. She didn't know there was a kid. There's so. a kid, you guys. Uh, oh shit! I, 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 he said no spoilers. My bad. I, I probably screwed it up. Anyway, we're all but, spoiled. But um, but yeah. So the idea of the sun, the idea of you know, you know, there is a an onward motion to life, goes away, comes back. It's that cycle. And so um, I think that was that was where we were trying to get to, and uh, hopefully we we got there. You guys, I have so many questions. I'm like, there. We have two minutes, three minutes left. Um, I guess we could just keep going. Like they don't mind. So I know you guys. guys who cares mind. about original screenplays, you guys? <laughs> the real talent is taking already existing material and making something out of it. You people with pure imagination, forget you. Uh, I. You know, the writing process, as you talked about moving into the edit, you know, if you guys, as we wrap up, sort of, what are those, you know, can you talk about something you discovered in the edit that, that surprised you um, and sort of changed your movie in some significant way? I figured out in the editing room that I had the wrong narrator. Um, so we had to completely, you know, we stopped for a week and I went away and completely rewrote the narration from a different character's point of view and we came back and put the film together differently. So there was a whole writing process for me that happened in the editing room, which I'd heard about, you know, like you read those <laughs> things and you just think, those people are so disorganized. <laughs> <laughs> I was so judgy. And then I realized it could be this kind of amazing process. That also requires producers who want you to do, are okay with this sudden reimagining at that late stage in a studio that supports it but that was kind of exhilarating as well as terrifying. So were you write, re rewriting the whole voiceover in the edit? I re the whole, rewrote the whole voiceover yeah in about a week and then we came back and I wrote it stream of consciousness so that we would come back and figure refigure out the film as opposed to just plaster it on. That's big. That's, that's yeah. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like you landed in the right place, though. It was exactly the right place. Yeah. And did you guys, did you want to just wrap up with some? I, I strongly feel that Sarah should now spoil the end of her movie, just to be fair. <laughs> Tell exactly. what the decision Come on, is. Sarah. Just say it now. What happens? You guys, they leave. <laughs> Sorry. You should have a YouTube channel where you just spoil people's movies. You guys. It's like my own talk show where I just like ruin every movie ever. Talk to my husband. This is my life, actually. I do this. Um, should we wrap up? What was the question? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, 
Quickly, I'll do one more quick fire thing. If there were one piece of advice you would give to your young writer self or your when you were just starting out in your career, what would you tell yourself? Persistence. Yeah, write more. Anxiety isn't a reason to not do something. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert, Todd Field, and Seth Rice. You know, Sean asked a very similar first question to the question I was going to ask, but I'm going to go in a slightly different direction. I'm wondering if you guys can remember the first screenplay you ever read and what that experience was like and how it then sort of led to you becoming a writer. It might have been adaptation because they, you know, they, they sometimes they publish these books and they're kind of incredible because they have an intro, they have behind the scenes, they have interviews and stuff like that. And I remember uh, reading it because uh, the intro is written by Robert McKee, um, mm. which is hilarious because I, it, you guys remember Robert McKee is the butt of the joke in the movie. And I remember for so long in college, I thought Robert McKee's uh, book was probably terrible because adaptation made fun of it. And uh, I went back and then read Story by McKee and it's kind of incredible. I, I mean, you guys, I don't know how many people have read it, uh, but I, actually McKee was a, a big reason why we were able to pull off this movie, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that, mo that, that movie was very formative for me in college, and so I picked it up, and it was a uh, really fun read. I don't know, yeah. Was that your question? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it's supposed to be rapid fire. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no. Uh, my, <laughs> mine might have been Eternal Sunshine. We're just like a tropes. Yeah, the same guy, so different obvious. movie. <laughs> You mean the first script I ever read? Yeah, yeah. It can be as, as an actor or any other capacity, too. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I didn't really... Um, I, what was the first script I ever read? You know, I started out as, a, as an actor, and um, we didn't often get scripts. They give you these so-called sides, you know, scenes, and, um, and you had to wonder about what happened and read it in the breakdown service uh, <laughs> that you got you know, diving in a dumpster for 20 bucks. You shared it with a guy so you could get the breakdown service. So um, I don't remember, that's a good question. I guess probably the first script I ever read um, completely or one of the f earliest scripts was probably um, Heather's. That's my answer, Todd. I'm pretty sure that's the first screenplay I ever read. Did you read the version where they go to prom in hell because they're all dead at the end? Yeah, that's the original Heather's ending, guys. Yeah. He killed them all. JD kills everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't remember. I just remember Winona Ryder, uh, I was told, really wanted me to play this part that Christian Slater ended up playing. And my wife had, was about ready to have a baby. And, um, and I was very nervous about that. I thought, I have to get a job, you know? So I called my then agent and said, um, I need a job. You know, I called her from Cedars. We just had the baby. And, um, and <laughs> <laughs> And she said, um, well, you just got to wait three weeks. You're going to get this part. And I said, no, I can't wait three weeks. I need to, I got to get to work now. You know, and, she, and, and, and I think she realized that she had to calm me down a little bit. Um, and so she, um, uh, she said, well, there's this, you can go over and see Roger Corman over on San Vicente. And there's this guy um, at AFI. He's directing his first film. And it turned out to be Carl Franklin. Oh, wow. And... Um, and I got the job, and she was furious, you know. Um, and I left for the Philippines, you know, three weeks later. So, um, but that was a really important, um, whatever. I'm going to digress. Anyway, that was the first. That was the first script, which was was Heather's, and I thought it was a great script. Uh, you know, I think um, he did a, a, an incredible job. It was it was one of those kinds of scripts you read, like like Charlie Kaufman's script, or or like Reservoir Dogs. That was you, you read these scripts that. People are doing things structurally and, and rhythmically that you'd never you never experienced before. Totally, and I love that that script creates its own like vernacular and language, and that's so hard to do on the page. Absolutely, yeah. Seth. How about you? I just will say the first thing that came to my head uh, it was the pilot for Six Feet Under. Oh wow! Um, I love it's the f I loved it, and it's such a 
wonderful mix of tones. Um, it really resonated with me, and when I was done with it, I just, oh, he knocked it out of the park. That's really impressive, too, because I feel like TV scripts are often really hard to sort of find if you don't go to the WGA library, where they have lots of wonderful TV scripts that you can read. But did you find it online? N no. Uh, that, that's the second question that I didn't expect. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, <laughs> I think it was part of like, like a literature class in college. It was, it was, it was an assignment. And so it, that's how I read it, yeah. That's a cool professor. That's a, that's a good get, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, since we started at the beginning, I thought we'd jump to the end. Um, but one of the things that I think all of these films do masterfully, and I think that includes The Fablemans and Nope 2, is that they absolutely stick the landing. It is so hard to write a great ending, and you all wrote tremendous endings in these scripts. I'm wondering how the ending sort of plays into your writing process. You know, are you thinking about the final image? Are you thinking about the final words? How does that sort of shape everything else that's on the page? Yeah, I think endings for me are usually, or for us at least, we're trying to give ourselves, because there's two of us kind of scrounging around in the dark together, we, we, we need to find a strong ending, otherwise, you know, there's no common, um, yeah, no common goal, no common image. Um, and for this one, uh, we always knew we wanted it to start off as a, just structurally as a, like, uh, chosen one hero's journey that then gets dissolved through the centrifuge of, like, infinity, and then, you know, the character experiences ego death, and the whole movie falls apart. And then, the, the, but, the, but our goal for the ending was, okay, if we can get our characters there, if we can get our audiences there, how do we pull ourselves out of that? What does it look like to, you know, en enter like full nihilism on a, just a character level and um, pull us, ourselves back out of it? And, and like that's, that was always our goal. We didn't know exactly the image or what it was gonna look like or what, how it would manifest, but we knew we wanted to, um, yeah, just, uh, basically try to recreate the journey that I went through when I was, because I, I grew up very religious, uh, evangelical, and what happens when your entire foundation gets pulled out from under you? How do you rebuild yourself out of the pieces? Um, and so that was the end image. Do you, do you remember the first image we had for the ending? I mean, I do think that like from the very first draft, it sort of ended like that, like with her at taxes, her doing her taxes pretty good. Like, we were like, we're like, let's make the audience care that she's finally good at her taxes, um, and that was like funny to us, but also like like hit the target of what the goal was to make her like appreciate life again, like uh, in its mundanity and stuff. Uh, and the the other the anecdote that comes to mind is that like sometimes we write too many endings in, and um, we did that again. And uh, there, and then we were in the edit room, and, and even when we were shooting this scene that we, we cut, our cinematographer was like, "End it here," D and and he was really anti the last <laughs> scene, and uh, so, uh, so there's this whole other scene where the family sings karaoke together in the parking lot, and they sing "Barbie Girl," and we had to decide like, does it end with "Barbie Girl" or does it end with "Taxes"? I need that director's cut, please. Can we get that as like a DVD it's, special no, feature? I'm, everything we cut, I'm proud we cut, but it, it is a special feature, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Todd, Seth, endings? Okay, Todd. Um, uh, well, Will and I were lucky because we landed on a structure of the movie pretty early on because it follows the structure of a, of a tasting menu. And so we knew, moose bouche, first course, second course, so we just knew you gotta end with dessert. So it was just what would ultimately make the most sense as we're ratcheting up the tension, heightening the sort of insanity in that restaurant, what makes the most sense thematically and also visually and as strange and weird as we can get that would still make sense within the, the box of the movie. And uh, so yeah, we, we were very lucky that we knew where we were going purely because, you know, if, <laughs> if it ever got boring in a course, well, let's just move on to the next course and know that you have to keep ratcheting up the tension. 
Next question. Now, you, ooh, no, no. Qu- I love that, like though. That? No, that's a valid answer. Um, I do think the internet very much enjoyed the Monster Hunter finale. Um, I That's a great way of talking a little bit more about Tara, though. I'm very curious. You know, this is your first original produced screenplay after two wonderful adaptations, Little Children and one of my favorite movies of all time, In the Bedroom. And I'm wondering what about Lydia Tarr sort of led you to to make her your first wholly original creation on the page. I've read too that you were thinking about the character for about 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, you, you're right. I, I uh, had mainly, um, I've been lucky to, you know, any of us are lucky to, to have somebody um, pay us, you know, and most of the time that's based on intellectual property unless, unless we're lucky enough to have a stretch of time to where we can write our own stuff, you know. Um, and I, I said this before. I have a, you know, I have a big family, so, um, uh, but not a big pocketbook. So I'm, I'm always sort of writing myself, you know. <laughs> I'm about a month ahead, m- like most of us, you know. And um, so this was unusual. I hadn't written anything original since film school, and that was a very long time ago. Um, and the it was a beginning of the pandemic. Um, and uh, it was middle of March, 2020, and uh, uh, Peter Kajowski and Kiska Hicks at Focus Features said, we wanna make a movie with you and write whatever you want. So it was like, oh, okay. You know, and, and I, I had some place to house her, you know, for the first time. But yeah, I'd been thinking about it for about 10 years. And, and their only sort of um, part of the conversation that we had it was, would you be interested in doing something about classical music with a conductor? That was it. There was no brief, there was no outline, there was nothing. They just left me alone for the next three months. Um, and, um, and, and she got very busy. You know. Do you find that freeing artistically when you sort of are just given carte blanche or do you like having some guardrails in place? And, and it, you know, Todd, you can follow up on that, but that can be open to anyone as well. I, well, I, I think at the time, I, I don't know, that's a very good question. Um, I think had the world not feel, felt like it was ending, mm. and if there was a certainty that there would be cinema, and that there was a certainty that all of us were gonna survive this thing, I, I probably would have been terrified to sit down and, and have to m- meet the responsibility of somebody paying me and not knowing what the hell I was doing. Mm. Um, but because those weren't the circumstances, I was, you know, it was just like, who cares, you know, I should just write whatever I want to write, and um, and I've been very, very lucky, you know, as, as you mentioned, I, you know, I've been like these fine writers over here, I've been adapting material or, or um, adapting your own material, and, um, I, and I've been lucky to work alongside some incredible writers, you know, and incredible fiction writers, and I'd always been really openly envious of them, be, and I would say to them, you know, what's it like? You know, it's kind of like, what's it like to, you know, have the training wheels taken off and have your own bike and go wherever you want to go? And um, and so that was thrilling, you know. I feel like it's the dream scenario for many writers in a lot of ways. But I have heard some writers, too, that they're like, no, I love a studio outline. I love, like, having somebody else say, that's not a great idea, and, like, having someone yeah. intervene. It's so different based on the individual writer. Well, when Stravinsky first came out to Los Angeles, there's a story I'll be brief, but he, he said, um, they said, you can write anything you want. You're Stravinsky. And he said, no, I can't do that. Do you want a symphony? Do you want an etude? Do you don't want it in B flat? I need something to push up against. And I, I think that's true. I think it's a, a really healthy way to work. Mm. Speaking of breaking all the rules, I would love to talk about everything, everywhere, all at once for a moment. I did get to peek at the actual screenplay, and I was amazed at how clear the visuals were represented on the page. You know, the movie is such an accomplishment on a very deep emotional level, but it's also just a feast for the senses. And I'm wondering how you guys sort of, you know, kept the North Star with the Central family, with Evelyn, throughout a movie that could have very easily easily descended into chaos at many points throughout the process. Yeah, I mean, and it, it does, and that was the point, you know. Um, <laughs> and then it was just like, how much is too much chaos? Uh, but it, I mean, it goes back to um, uh, him finding out that McKee's book was good, and uh, <laughs> and, us find, and us finding that ending, that then the whole goal was like to kind of play with chaos and, and, and 
to kind of have like a traditional journey of a family reconnecting and then to use the chaos of modern life as the villain and, and then that give us permission to just be our most unhinged uh, music video director selves <laughs> but like but know that like it was always going to be pushing up against the the real priority which is you know this this personal story we've come up with you know it's also worth just reiterating the obvious which is um that last draft, it, it reads well. And then every other draft <laughs> is just a mess. It's like completely, um, I, I think of it as like um, every draft you're trying to hit multiple targets with an arrow. So you throw up like five different targets and you you try to make sure you get through, like if you can get through one of them with the first draft, you're like, you feel great, mm. that's amazing. But then you, you try to readjust and realize, oh, okay, I got the family arc, but then the, the chaos is too much. Okay, let's try to readjust and I want the action to still feel good. And you, you try again, you throw it up. And you know you you get the first two, or you get the you miss the first one, you get the second two, and so much of it is just is just recalibrating every single time you you kind of sit down and go like, okay, that didn't work. <laughs> what are we going to do this time? And it feels sometimes like cold engineering rather than art, um, which is you know you have to be able to do both. I think to be a, a good screenwriter, you have to, like structure is so important. You're talking about the men the menu structure is great because that that's why the whole thing works. Is be and you're right. You, you you say it's like a, a like a crutch that like anytime something gets boring, you can you can move forward. Yeah. But I think the brilliance is in just choosing that structure to begin with. I think just picking a good structure from the beginning is like so important. Any anyways, I, I do think that like uh, the magic trick of 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 writing comes from just like being willing to throw away a lot and retry and retry and retry. Um, so yeah, our, our first draft was like 240 pages and just uh, incomprehensible, but... Uh, I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, about how long did it take you guys to then whittle that draft down to like something approximating a shooting script? Uh, let's see, the, the 240 was like, uh, summer of 2017, and then uh, we shot three years later, like two and a half years later. But you know, we weren't writing the whole time, you know. Uh, and, and pretty quickly, that 240 we turned into like a 120, and then it was just bouncing around 120 for years. But still, we were throwing things out, new characters. Uh, I, I will say one one of the greatest blessings of. of you know, the fact that no one knew who we were or cared about us is that um, we couldn't find money and we couldn't find a cast. And that actually bought us a lot of time because mm. I think we would have, you know, we would have just jumped right in. It's like, oh, we're ready. Let's go shoot. Um, but every year something would go go wrong or the, the money would fall through or an actor schedule would, would have to push. And um, it, that meant we had to go back to just sitting with our script and realizing it wasn't ready. And so, you know, those three years was, uh, we were trying to actively make it every year, and every year it fell through, we actually made the script better. And so, I don't, like, I do think, you know, a lot of people um, who write original stuff, I think, it, you're just filled with a lot of doubt. You know, you have no idea uh, why it's taking you so long to write the script, but I do think, um, I do think time is, is, is the reason why it's so, like, our film, I, th I think it was a success, and if we had rushed it in, in the way that I think a lot of you know a lot of studios ha they're on a schedule and they have to push everything out every two years, then a new movie. Like I think uh, we would be terrible filmmaking filmmakers in that structure. And so like give yourself the time to really perfect it and don't beat yourself up. This movie took us like seven years to make, and it it paid off. We're here now. You guys know who we are. It's <laughs> I'm actually really nervous about next time because it means our next film's going to be expedited, and that terrifies me honestly. <laughs> Take heed, writers. Maybe one day you too will be thankful for a very long development process. <laughs> uh, you know, Seth, we're talking about how beautifully the menu is structured, and it's absolutely true. And you and Will pull off such a magic trick in terms of tone with the menu. To me, that is so often the missing ingredient in so many modern films. I'm sorry, I had to do it, guy. I had to do it. Um, but it's. I feel like a lot of filmmakers struggle with tone specifically, and. You you guys manage some incredibly brutal tonal swings on the page, and I'm wondering sort of throughout the process how you're able to make those swings hit as hard at the, as they do, not only for the first reader of the screenplay, but all the way throughout the production process through the final edit. Um, Will and I never talked about tone. I don't think we should ever talk about tone. I think if, <laughs> if you're co-writing with someone, your brains are interlinked in terms of tone. Uh, the things that you can never argue about tone. You can argue about story and figure story out. But if you're arguing about tone, 
you probably shouldn't be working together. Um, and then, but that said, it's easier to write a mixture of tones. Well, I think what Will and I learned, because I think this gets into the actual production, and Will and I were so lucky to be on set for the entire production, and we got to sit in the edit. Putting that mixture of tones up on its feet, that's, our, that's an amazing director, that's amazing actors, and that's an amazing editor, because it's so much easier to write. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually so much, if, you, if you're someone who gets that tone and you're reading it, oh, you get it, you get, oh, there's funny here, and uh, there's horror elements here, and then it's what you, you, you get it, if, if we do a good job as writers. But to put it up on its feet and to know that, like, well, you see a cut and it's like, actually, it's a beat off, just a beat. And that, you get that beat right, and it's perfect. And that's, that's the editing, and that's having super smart actors understand what they're doing in each scene. And we had, like, I, Will and I left set every day thinking, holy shit, we have the best actors for these parts. They are making this so much better. They get it. Our director gets it. Our producers get it. Everyone gets it. Searchlight gets it. And having everyone get it, that's, that's how you make that, that's how you actually see it, as opposed to just writing it. You know, you mentioned the ensemble, and it is a really terrific ensemble in this film. And I'm wondering about, you know, when you're crafting these characters on the page without knowing that eventually they're going to be played by J Hong Chow or Janet McTeer, how you sort of, you know, manage all of these secondary antagonists with one big antagonist. I feel like there are scripts that attempt that, but it's really hard to actually pull off. That's, see, that's another, like, um, and I'm, I'm not trying to be, like, Will and I never thought about an antagonist either. We just kind of wrote who we wanted to be in that movie, and we knew what roles they would play. And there also came a time where we did start writing for Ray Fiennes. There came a point where Will and I were like, if we're lucky enough to get this guy, who has no clue who the fuck we are, like, <laughs> if we can get him, this is perfect for him. And we just kind of started tailoring it to him, to him. And, and then we were so lucky to get Anya. I think she's incredible in the movie um, because she anchors the movie down. I think without her, it would fly away and because the audience gets to see everything through her. And then our casting, our casting person was brilliant. They just, it, it all, it all fits so nicely. I'm, Sounds really wonderful. You guys are sharing a writer brain. That's really rare. We, we do share a writer brain. And Todd and I also share a writer brain. We <laughs> wrote Tar together. Oh, incredible. Incredible. Um, so you can ask me the ending question now. Great, great, great. You can tell us all about Monster <laughs> yeah. Hunter. Um, that is a great way of talking about, though, you know, writing for specific actors. And Todd, I know I read the wonderful story about how you sort of wrote Kate Blanchett's name on a post-it note and sort of manifested her for the role and were thinking about her throughout the writing process. But I also read that you don't typically do that when you're writing. So I'm wondering how, you know, writing for a specific actor in mind and then the eventual wonderful collaboration that you guys had had sort of shaped the script as it was coming together on the page. Well, I, I mean, in one way, it was it was really um, weird, you know, um, because I don't know. I mean, do you guys do you think of actors when you write? Do you always think of actors when you write? No. I, do you guys think of actors when you write? I, I do. We kind yeah. of always do. Guys, do. Yeah. At do least guys, somebody. I mean, I mean, you, if you're, I mean, there was yeah, a maybe it feels, and some notes. It's, it's kind of limiting, you know. I mean, if you're thinking about an actor, you, it's you know, I've said this a million times, but if you're if you're thinking about an actor, you're, you're probably doing them a disservice because you it's it's based on something you've seen them do, and it's fairly reductive, and it's probably very reductive to the material, you know. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I I I'd met her long ago. I'd met her years before we were going to do a, a, a film that Joan Didion and I had written together, and um, it didn't come to fruition, um, and, that, and maybe that's why I was thinking about her. Not not really as a performer, but the evening that we spent together, because mm. she um, she has an incredible mind, you know, and a, um, and a facility um, in terms of articulating ideas at the pitch of perception, and probably that's why she, you know probably why I started thinking about it. At first, I was just swatting it away, like oh no, but she was relentless, you know. So. Um, uh, yeah, that was different. That was really different. Um, I don't think I would, 
It wasn't by design or anything, no. Yeah, and you know, I think it's really interesting too in terms of the way Lydia Tarr has taken on this kind of second life online. You know, we all sort of saw the articles of people being like, wait a minute, she's not a real person, <laughs> uh, which I found very fascinating. And I wonder if that was surprising for you too, sort of seeing this online groundswell of like, you know, fan videos for Lydia Tarr, sort of like lots of memes, t shirts, et cetera. Oh, um yeah, I mean, it, you would never expect such things to happen. Um, but uh, but I, I, in hindsight, I understand it because when we were editing, um, you know, three days in, into editing, Monica, Willie, and I, um, you know, we'd go for these long walks. We were in a bubble someplace, and, um, and we started talking about her like she was real and that we were cutting a documentary. Um, mm. And that's really owing to Kate. You know, that's what you're talking about, Seth, you know, which is what happens when uh, you leave the page, what happens when the performer comes in and interprets it. And uh, she had us said hello, you know, um, very, very quickly in that first interview with Adam Gottnick. And we weren't looking at her anymore, mm. you know. Um, and I think a lot of times, if you're lucky enough to, to um, stay with your material that you write, um, that happens when you work with supremely talented people, you know? I mean, I remember, whatever, I'm gonna get too digressive. Go ahead, next question. We love it, we can do a quick digression. We got time for a quick digression. No, I just remember, I remember, and this is 100 years ago, but I made this film called Little Children, and um, I remember I flew to London to screen it for Kate Winslet, and she walked into the screening room and I said, what the fuck happened to you? And she said, I'm not that character. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you spend so much time with them and the, you know, alone in the edit room, you know, the hair is different. <laughs> that always happens to me. Yeah, no. In the edit, I like form a relationship with the character and then I'm very confused when I see the actor again. Especially like, Jamie, Jamie Lee Curtis is like, very different. Really intimidating in yeah. person, like as as a real person. But Deirdre is like very funny. Yeah, um, I, I will I will I will say that like um, for anyone out there who is listening, there, there's so many different ways to do things. Uh, we do argue about tone all the time, but I think but I think it's because we're going to direct it eventually, and so we have to be doing that. Right. Um, and then we write to actors. And we know we're going to throw them away. We know, like, okay, this person is never going to say yes. Well, but it's it's helpful for us because, in case you guys are like us, we're terrible at writing characters. Like, I, that, yeah. I never think anyone's yeah. going to say yes. Oh yeah, exactly. I yeah. never think yeah. anyone's going to say yes to anything. I think yeah. they're all going to hate everything. Yeah, they're going to get it and hate <laughs> this and say no. And so I would always, I always say, well, when we send a when we send a script to somebody, the moment we send it, I'll send a text. Did they pass yet? Yeah, yeah. Right yeah. when we send it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a fast, a fast pass is the best. It's yeah. a really good feeling. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I just, I just, I'm just want to say that to all the writers who are just not really good at character, like that's not where we start from. We always we're outside in writers, not inside out writers. And so uh, it's we 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 it takes us until the last few drafts to what that's when we go like, oh, I know who this person is. And so writing with an actor in mind actually really helps us because we need those training wheels. As long as you're willing to forget the actor at a certain point yes. and be yeah. like, yeah. oh, this is not right for that person now. Exactly, yeah. Seth, what an interesting experience to get to be on set during filming throughout the menu. That's all too rare for writers, unfortunately, too often. And I'm wondering, you know, this film is so of the moment. It's definitely fitting in with this sort of larger trend of things like the White Lotus, Infinity Pool, Parasite, that mm. are sort of very cutting class satires. But I'm wondering if, you know, the way you thought about the film evolved at all over the last couple of years, and particularly these last couple very weird, horrible, difficult years in America. <laughs> I, I will say that uh, we always, first off, we saw the movie in two ways. One, an artist filled with self-loathing uh, who is one of the saddest people alive and how he was, and how he snaps. Mm. That was like, num that was really number one. Two, when it comes to the rich stuff, I think that I don't dislike rich people. I hope to be rich someday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what Will and I were really getting at, just by virtue of the restaurant, 
you have to have a lot of money to go to this restaurant, mm -hmm. right? You, you have to. So the clientele is going to be rich. Um, I think what Will and I were more interested in is the concept of entitlement. Mm -hmm. You can be entitled, you can be any class and be entitled and come off like an asshole. So, and I think what we were interested in is how entitled people feel entitled to content and how they feel they consume and consume and consume and consume content and maybe they don't think about who's actually creating the content for them. That said, if you're a chef at one of these restaurants, you have chosen your vocation. You do have to provide the content. That's your job. And so all the, all the customers and the chef, they, need, they all need each other. They're all in this weird sort of uh, entitlement ecosystem together. And so this is sort of the chef's way of breaking it. By, by the way, creating what he calls his masterpiece. So his ego run amok. So I, there's, who's bad and who's good in the movie, I hope if Will and I did our job, is mixed. Um, but then again, if we didn't do our job, the chef's a bad guy. <laughs> I have to ask, who came up with the s'mores specifically? Again, we're doing ending spoilers, guys. I'm sorry. No, I. You know what? I. Here's the the a good anecdote for that is for a script that is very written. Will and I came up with the idea of s'mores, but we underwrote that part. We have Margot on the boat. It blows up. We don't see anything. We just it's the idea that oh he's going to do s'mores. Okay, but Rafe was like, I think I've been a big part of this movie for the entire time. I feel like it would make sense if I had something at the end to do. And we were like, that makes sense. And then he wrote to Will and I pretty much his monologue at the end of the movie about s'mores and fire. And Will and I read it, we were like, <laughs> one, it was really cool because he cared, he cared so much. And it was for, for us, for, to have an actor like that care so much for our sort of first movie was like really heartwarming. And two, he knew the character so well that it was pretty letter perfect. And then we copied it <laughs> and we put it in the document. <laughs> we fixed all the punctuation because this guy, he doesn't know anything. <laughs> it was just one long run on set. He's a, he's a dummy. But, and then no. And, and then, and then uh, we, that's how it came to be, and that's how it came to be bigger. And then Mark, our director, was like, we want to do this big, we want a Grant Ackett sort of uh, Alinea type thing. We want to see all that. And our production designer, Ethan Tobin, was like, I can create all that. So the ending was very much a big collaborative effort, which was cool. Yeah. I feel like that's the best possible version, right? Like, oh, yeah. Actor, it was director, writer. Like, yeah, let's do more of that, please. Thank cool. you. Um, you know, you mentioned consuming content. And I think something that we're all sort of struggling with in these ongoing pandemic years is just the constant flow of information. 75,000 new movies on streaming, 2,000 tweets, just a constant flow of things you need to pay attention to. But this question is kind of for everybody. I'm wondering how you guys sort of stay true to yourself and nourish yourself as artists while trying to keep up with just, you know, the movies that are out in a given year, the, your peers that you're going to be seeing. Like, how do you sort of manage that and, and stay true to yourself within it? How are you guys doing? I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just say real fast, was, I think the cool thing about the movies, all the movies that are nominated, uh, they're, in both categories, they're all like, feel like big swings. Big, audacious swings that come from a cool concept that you desperately want to execute without any knowledge of else what's going on. It's like, I have a big, cool idea, and I got to do it. And I feel, it feels like all the movies this year feel like that in a certain sense. And I, I think that's how you just stay true to yourself. I've been reading this book called How to Do Nothing. Uh, it's great. Um, it's like this artist, but uh, she wrote this whole like kind of dissection about how it's an activist thing to like go on a walk uh, in a world that doesn't want you to do that, you know? Um, and it's been really nice giving myself permission to do that because there's a little too much going on, yeah. You're like, oh, I can turn off a device? I don't need to look at my phone for yeah, hours like, at a time? It's an activist statement to take a long bath. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> um, 
I want to do a couple sort of like rapid fire questions because we are unfortunately running out of time. But, um, you know, I think it's fascinating the way writers interact with music and the writing process. Obviously, there is a direct tie with a number of these films with the sort of musical life that happens in the film. But I'm wondering, do you guys listen to music while you're writing? Do you find it distracting? Um, are you making custom playlists for things? Yeah, we come from music videos, and so the way we learned to write was actually um, through that process. For those of you who don't know, you, uh, they, they send you a song, and they send you a, a brief. Usually it, it says, like, the band wants to look cool, but we don't want to do anything. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like that kind of thing. And then, and then you get, like, a, a deadline. You're like, and we need it by next week. And sometimes uh, it'll be like, yeah. he's into Hawaiian shirts lately. Exactly, and that's it. You're like, <laughs> okay. And like that's, and then you have you have like 24 hours, maybe 48 hours to come up with an idea, find some images, put put together a treatment, and throw it out into the ether. And you don't get paid for any of it. And you can go. We we basically went like eight months without getting paid, and we wrote like three treatments a week, and it was wow. miserable. But because of that, we are so fast at coming in with. We, we are really like we are that muscle is really strong, and especially when music's playing. When music is, is playing, and so uh, while writing this script. Um, I just started the playlist, and you know, over the you know four or five years it took to write, the playlist is now like I don't know, fourteen hours long or yeah. something like that. Um, because anytime I'm listening to something, I'm like, oh, this 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 needs to go in as a reference. I don't to think I ever yeah. put a single song on that right. playlist. Is there, is there, uh, <laughs> but I would write to it. I'd be right. like, what's Dan put in there? And I'd, right. I'd put it on shuffle, and and yeah, and and then I'd be like, dude, that song you put in there. And then that's actually how we found the composers for the movie, too. Um, Sun Lux, I, they had never done a movie score together, but um, you know, over the course of a few years, multiple songs of theirs made its way into the playlist. And we went on a deep dive, and we, we, we saw they, there's three guys, and each of them have their own solo albums. And I started putting some of their stuff in it, too. And finally, we're like, these guys are perfect. So you, know, you might be able to find your composer in the process of, of making this playlist. It's, it's a two-for-one deal. Um, yeah. Music's really important. We love a happy accident. Um, Todd, I'm particularly curious uh, how you were thinking about sort of music informing Tar. Were you thinking about music while you were writing, or is it sort of separate in your mind? I wasn't really listening to any of the music that's in the film. Um, I was listening to some other music, and I, I too write to music, and I always have. Um, and uh, oftentimes, um, it'll be a single piece of music so that I can get to the point where I don't hear it anymore. Um, uh, but it feels right, you know, and if it feels like um, things are plateauing out, I'll, I'll find another piece of music. But I normally stick to maybe one or two tracks, that's it. And um, on this film, uh, there were like two or three tracks I listened to, and um, one was a Skoreshki piece uh, uh, that I got kind of activated and turned on to when I was at AFI. Uh, it came out in 92, I think it was a Kronos Quartet. Mm. Um, and and there was a couple of pieces by Emma Thover's daughter, Metamorphosis, and um, some other stuff. But I didn't listen to any um, canonical work. I didn't listen to Elgar, Mahler. You know, that's a big part of the movie. I didn't listen to any of it mm. while I was writing. Fascinating. Seth? Um, I don't listen to music. It would distract me. I need the walla of, like, a coffee shop or a restaurant. And then to know that I can have a sweet treat at any moment if I want to. <laughs> and, then the, and then the walla goes away as you start. It, like... For some reason, you don't hear it anymore. And then, uh, in terms of the music for the movie, I mean, Colin Stetson, his soundtrack is is unbelievable. And really, I mean, I'm not going to say anything interesting in the sentence I'm about to say. Makes the movie better. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was because I, I remember actually an early edit where there were a lot of horror. There was a lot more like horror stings. Mm. And I think we were like, we I think collectively it should be classical. Music should be a classical score to sort of underscore the craziness of the restaurant, the classy with what's going on. And then he, I think he just, Mark, and I think our producer Betsy just gave him that note, and Mark, I think Colin just went off and did it. And we then we put it in. Yeah, he's a brilliant, brilliant guy. We love composers. On that note, we have to wrap, but thank you so much to our incredible panel. Daniel Kwan, Daniel Shiner, Todd Field, and Seth Rice. <laughs>